Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm Ellen Pristak. I coordinate the Great Mind Salon, and it is my pleasure today to have Adina Langer as our presenter. Just going to read a little bit about her biography, which is actually quite impressive. Um, for more than 15 years, Adina Langer has focused her museum career on interpreting traumatic historical events for diverse audiences while emphasizing the dignity and individuality of the people who experience them. An active curator, oral historian, educator, presenter, editor, blogger, and published author, she has created or co-curated more than 18 exhibits with permanent homes in three museums, presence on the web, and a busy schedule traveling to the library, school, and community center circuit. Langer grew up in Princeton Junction, New York, and attended the Princeton Jewish Center's religious school through confirmation. She received her BA in history and creative writing from Oberlin College and her MA in archives and public history from New York University. And as I always do, for those of you who attend the Great Mind Salon, I always take credit when one of the, the presenters is a student, a former student of mine or relative of a former student of mine. And I am happy to say that Adina and her brother Micah were both students of mine. And I'm so glad that she's now a presenter for Great Mind Salon. So Adina, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I can say Ellen was my first teacher of the Holocaust. Um, so kind of turning my career, finding myself here, um, Ellen planted the seeds. So um, thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, so the topic of my presentation today is the tragedy of the St. Louis, which is a historical topic, but it is also an exhibit that we produced here at the Museum of History and Holocaust Education at Kennesaw State University, uh, where I am the curator. And uh, this exhibit had the misfortune of opening in March of 2020. So um, Susan Berman is also here with us. She is a longtime friend of Ellen. Um, and has become um, a friend and an inspiration to me. And you're going to learn about her family's story as well. Um, the presentation that I'm about to share with you is one that I would also give to high school age students. And I wanted to do that purposefully because I know that a lot of you are really interested in how we do Holocaust education and how we do it for a really diverse audience. So this exhibit, um, this, this presentation um, was first produced oriented for our summer workshop series that we do each summer. This was our first virtual summer workshop. And there were students present from all over the world, from China to South America to all over the United States. So really thinking about our audience is something we always do in um, museum education and in Holocaust education. So keep that in mind as we go through and we're gonna do an open Q&A at the end. But um, as we go along, I'm gonna ask you to post your questions and comments in the chat and I can relay them to the rest of the group. So we're actually gonna start with a little pre-session activity. Um, and I would like you to, to take a look at this um, image here. It's actually a postcard image. Um, and just think about your initial reaction. What emotions um, do you feel when you are looking at this image? Don't be shy, you can, you can write anything that comes to mind. Hi, Adina. Hi, Debbie. It, it seems to me that you look at these cruise liners from that era and you think how fortunate people were. They must have been so excited 
to go on the St. Louis. There, I'm sure there were people on the ship who were not just trying to escape Nazi Germany, but people who were also there for other reasons, to take a vacation, to see something new. Um, so there were people on that ship, I'm sure, that had, and maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me, I mean, that had all kinds of different reasons for being there. Well, yeah, well, as we go through the presentation, well, for those of you who know this story well, it might be a review, and for those of you that it's a little bit new, you're going to learn some things, but definitely noticing that it's this luxury cruise, right? This is a luxury liner, it's not a little boat, it's a big ship. Um, and so what that makes you feel, you know, might vary. Um, and so in the chat, I'm seeing, I'm seeing sadness, which might come from someone who kind of knows this story. Um, someone, uh, other people fear trepidation, worrying about seasickness. I mean, you're getting ready to go on a boat. That's, um, that doesn't always mean um, happy and a happy excitement for everyone. Um, and so, yeah, bleakness, black smoke. So some of this is kind of the, the fact that it's a black and white image, but definitely think about, you know, your reaction to this and how that might, it might be different if you didn't know the end of the story. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and um, advance the slides. So as Ellen gave some background information about me, um, my role here at the museum is uh, as the curator, I manage our exhibits program, our collections, and that includes our oral history program. Um, personally, um, I am descended from immigrants. Um, my great grandparents were Jews who emigrated to the US from Central and Eastern Europe around the turn of the 20th century. So our whole family has more of that um, Golden Door era um, immigration story than the post Holocaust immigration story. Um, but I find myself therefore very connected to these questions of immigration and refuge. Um, this is something that has always been of interest in my life. And even now we, um, we're a family that lives all over the country. Um, and every member of my family, both my um, nuclear family growing up and my nuclear family now, um, we were all born in different states. So that's just a little background about us. Um, as a curator, I am always thinking about context. So if I pick a particular story um, or where we were given a grant to um, produce an exhibit, you're thinking about the context that surrounds that story. Um, you know, what historical events contributed to the choices that were available to the actors in the story, and in this case, Jewish people who were hoping to flee Germany in the 1930s. How did they make decisions? How do we make decisions? And how are our decisions affected by the constraints of our environment and the political, social, economic circumstances that we find ourselves in? And then this connection to the individual, the family, um, to real people that we can, we, can, we can resonate with emotionally. What impact do these historical events have on individual people's lives? So this tagline, meet history face to face, this is a big part of, of our museum. Everything we do, we try to bring it back to that opportunity to meet history face to face. So, we are going to talk today about the role that inter international immigration policy had in restricting options for people who were seeking safe havens from Nazism, um, the relationship between Cuba, the United States, and Germany in the 30s, so that's in that historical context, um, and then this question of the timeline and, and making decisions. Who decides, who gets to decide that it's time to flee a bad situation? Um, how does that affect those who depend on them? Um, you know, so there are people who can make decisions and there are people who can't make decisions in a family. And you're going to get to meet the Simon family um, of Kroppenburg, Germany. And this is Susan Heinemann Berman's family. So Susan, if you wanna to wave to anybody who um, hasn't um, gotten to meet you yet, um, then there, there she is. So we're going to start here um, at the turn of the 20th century and look at some of the events that led to these questions of nation and who belongs in the nation. 
So before the St. Louis set sail, going back to the beginning, um, we're looking at some world events. Um, 1902, Cuba becomes an independent republic following the Spanish-American War and years as a U.S. protectorate. So Cuba and the United States have had this long relationship um, and it has been one where the U.S. has acted as an imperial power, but also acted as a, um, you know, benefactor, you know, in the fight against Spanish imperialism. There's a lot of, um, you know, questions around independence and what that really means. After World War I, the United States, like lots of other part places in the world, um, is concerned about immigration feels that there might be fallout from this international war um, and that uh, it might be a time to look inward. Now, when I say the United States feels that way, I don't mean everyone. We all know that um, any political moment has uh, people who are advocating strongly one way or another way. But the upshot in the 1920s is that the United States officially and at the federal level took a very isolationist turn. And um, part of that was the passage of the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which set really strict quotas for immigration from the um, from Europe, um, from the essentially the entire Eastern hemisphere. Um, so keep that in mind um, as we get into the rise of Adolf Hitler. 1933 is when Hitler rises to power, and it is also when Franklin Roosevelt becomes the president of the United States. So we have these two um, parallel uh, new leaders coming on board. So for the Simon family, who we're focusing on to set the set the stage, the context, um, Edith Simon is born um, in 1922. She is the the oldest of three. Um, of, of four sisters, excuse me. So then Ruth and Hilda are almost like twins. They're very close in age. And then Ilsa, their youngest, is born in 1928. And they come from this successful German Jewish family um, that uh, is a cattle and horse breeding and trading family. Um, and they are part of Germany's established Jewish population. 523,000 Jews, that's 1% of the German population at that time. To put that in context, Jews also make up a little over 1% of the population of the United States. So you can kind of get the sense of what that, what that means. Um, the Simon girls attend a parochial school, which is a Catholic school, but they also attend synagogue on Saturday. So they are an observant family. So um, here's a question to consider. Um, and Susan, I mean, you probably have exact answers to this question, but do you think the Simon sisters thought of themselves as Jewish, German, or a mixture of both? You know, how do you think of yourself as someone living um, in this country? Um, and if anybody wants to answer in the chat, um, I can read off some of the answers. Does anybody want to share? So we have a, a white, a white Jewish American cisgender woman. So that, that's getting a bunch of different identities, a, a racial category, a, another racial slash religious category, and Jewish cisgender, um, you know, the, the gender that you were identified with at birth being the one that you still hold as part of your identity. So we have a lot of Jewish, um, German, and then Jewish. Um, Germans, and then Jewish, American Jew. I still remember back in Hebrew school, the discussion about being an American Jew or a Jewish American, and that really meant different things to different people. So I think Germany at this time, having had this very um, 
diverse Jewish population, a highly assimilated Jewish population. A lot of people thought of themselves as Jewish Germans. They were German, but they were also Jewish. So um, we are now going to move forward in time and talk about the idea of home. So 1935, this is a pivotal year in the history of the Third Reich in Germany. Um, Hitler and the Nazis have really solidified their power and now they are starting to move with changing the landscape of citizenship in the country. And one of the big things that they do um, for the Jewish population is they pass the Nuremberg race laws, which redefine Jews as non-citizens. They are subjects of the Third Reich, not citizens of the Third Reich, and that restricts their rights within Germany. Now, keep in mind, this is already a totalitarian state. The, there's one party. Um, we're kind of moving in that direction. There's only one party allowed. You can't be anything other than a Nazi if you're in a political party, but there are still rights that German citizens have. And once the Jewish population is, is, has those rights taken away, um, their fate is much more uh, tenuous. Um, to Cuba, 1936, uh, Federico Laredo Brew becomes president of Cuba. And then um, as tensions are rising in Germany, um, the Evian Conference is convened in France. Um, and this is, a recognition that there is a refugee crisis, that there are people who want to leave and where can they go? Well, remember, we just passed this law 10 years before, which makes it really difficult for people to come to the United States. And the US is not the only place that's done something like that. So despite knowing about this persecution and having 32 countries come together, together to talk about it, only the Dominican Republic of all those countries actually agrees to accept more refugees. Um, meanwhile, the, the Simon family is making do in a situation that is getting more tense. But of course, at this time, there's always the possibility that things could change for the better. There's that possibility. And um, the Simon sisters, though, are no longer allowed to attend the parochial school that they've been attending. They now are going to a Jewish school in Oldenburg, which is a large town nearby, Kloppenburg. Um, and at the same time, because the, they work in private, enterprise instead of for the government, they have a little bit more freedom as a family to keep going with what they're doing. So um, Carl Simon is able to maintain most of his business clients. So that gives you a sense of their kind of socioeconomic status at a time when a lot of Jews who were working for the government or for universities, teachers in, in public schools, they're all stripped of their ability to keep doing what they're doing. So, um, 1933, when Hitler came to power, 37,000 Jews immediately leave. Um, and, uh, you know, what do you think may have made the Simon family feel like they could stay, you know, maybe didn't need to leave right away? Um, and, you know, what, what do you think you might do if laws were changed that took away your citizenship? I'd love just a, a few thoughts on those questions. Well, while you're, you're, I'm not seeing anything coming across right now. Um, okay, yeah, so Ellen has, has the note that many thought the laws were temporary and wouldn't last. This was an extremist government. You know, prior to the 32 election, um, the, Nazi the Nazi party and the Communist party, they were the two extremes and the central 
um, you know, coalition in, in Weimar Republic Germany was the middle, and they were the, you know, the ones that were kind of upholding the rights of that republic. So you're, there's still this question that this might not last. And then this sense of identity that you have roots, you know, in Germany, and that might make you feel confident, you know, that your family's been here for, you know, you can trace it back maybe 500 years, you know, this is a big part of your identity. Um, so I'm seeing, um, yeah, uh, Linda Oppenheim is talking about um, assimilation, um, how successfully assimilated German Jews were, and the veterans of the, the First World War. Thank you for bringing that up. That's a really important point. So a lot of German Jews had fought in the First World War, and that was, you know, a, a, a big part of their um, patriotism. Um, and yeah, so some uh, Michelle Alpern's talking about Ukraine and, you know, considering leaving, you know, it's amazing how, you know, our historical understanding does shift our responses to what's going on in the world. Um, so how tenuous, you know, your status might be based on the legal structure of your country and where you might feel safe. So all of that's going through their heads um, and, and can be going through ours. So now we're getting to Kristallnacht. This is a major, major moment. Um, this is essentially when the Nazi violence that, that's brewing under the surface is made apparent to the entire world. Um, it's impossible to ignore after Kristallnacht. Um, and as a result of that, um, there is a movement right after Kristallnacht of um, British, Jewish, and Quaker leaders in, um, in the UK to create a kinder transport, which um, will make essentially refugee status, um, protected status available to children from Germany and then soon Austria as well. So these, these German occupied places. Um, the United States does not pass a similar a uh, piece of legislation. So there is a bill um, that comes across, the, the Wagner Rogers Refugee Aid Bill, which could have helped German Jewish children, and it doesn't pass. So that's important to know. For the Simon family, this is a terrible time. Carl Simon is arrested and taken to Soskenhausen concentration camp on November 10th. Um, Ruth Simon, um, who is, uh, is, is Susan Berman's mother. She witnessed the synagogue where her school was located on fire when she got there and um, didn't know what was going on, came home to find her father missing and her mother and her sisters crying and upset and, and vandalism in their, their hometown of Kloppenburg where they'd never experienced really signs of anti-Semitism before, not, not on that level. So, the so so um, Selma Simon, their mother, has to make a really difficult decision. Um, she knows that she can send two of her daughters only on the kinder transport to England, and so she makes the choice to send Ruth and Hilda, the two middle daughters, because they are close in age and they can take care of each other, and, um, and they're they're the ones who are going to go. So, I I might skip this a little so we can keep moving but um the i just want to you know share these wonderful images of you with you of the, the the two sisters and um their how kristallnacht you know became this really major turning point in the life of the whole family um and and people started to move you know in in different directions so we're now getting closer to the departure of the St. Louis. Um, people um, who can um, book passage on the St. Louis and, and other refugee ships, um, refugee uh, you know, trains, people are starting to try to get out of Germany. Um, January to May of 1939, this is exactly what happens though um, to Debbie Brett's question in the beginning, 937 people book passage on the MS St. Louis. 
Um, many of them are refugees hoping to wait in Cuba for US visas. So they all have already applied for US visas. Um, and they've also had to purchase special landing permits that were available, made available to them by the Cuban Director General of Immigration, Manuel Benitez Gonzalez. However, this official is taking bribes. He's also not part of the, the, the party of the Cuban president. And so this is kind of an internal political matter that ends up um, really affecting these would-be refugees to Cuba. So May 8th, um, there is an anti-Semitic demonstration. Um, historians and scholars have kind of looked into the, the connection between German operatives in Cuba and this demonstration and kind of the fomenting of anti-Semitism in, um, in this space. But a lot of it is really anti-immigrant sentiment. Who are these people coming to take our jobs? Um, who are these people coming possibly to bring, um, you know, the wrong kind of government, um, either communist government or even fascist government to our small island republic where we do not want them, essentially. So this is a, a public demonstration and um, President Group cancels the landing permits. So here we have this, this information, it's relayed back to Germany, um, but the captain of the St. Louis and the passengers are not informed. So we're, we're now having, an, essentially there's gonna be an experiment that these people are the un, unwitting, you know, um, uh, subjects of, um, with regards to the Nazi government to see what happens when you send these would-be refugees on their way, knowing in advance that they're not gonna be allowed to land. So the Simon family is about to intercept with St. Louis. After his release from Soskenhausen, Carl Simon books passage for his family. Um, his wife and his two daughters, the ones who did not go on the kinder transport, um, Edith and Ilsa. And this is really important. And this took, it took a lot of research to really get the nitty gritty to figure this out. But the cost of the voyage on the St. Louis is estimated to have been between 1,500 and 2,000 Reichsmarks per passenger, $40,000 in 2020 US currency. So if you think about what happened between 1935 and 1939 to the Jewish population of Germany that, that stayed behind and how by then they had already been systematically deprived of their access to um, good paying jobs, to their wealth. Um, right after Kristallnacht, um, the Jewish population of Germany was fined, um, I believe it was a billion Reichsmarks from the whole population that had to be collected to pay for the damage because they were blamed. Oh, this was a, a popular response to, um, you know, a, a Jewish person's act of terrorism um, in a foreign country. That's that, that was the, the line that was delivered by the German government. So the Jews, it, to have $40,000 to, to pay for a voyage, this is not an easy thing to come by. So this gives you a sense of kind of who this group of Jews are, refugees, even compared with the rest of the people left behind. And um, so the other thing to keep in mind, that quota system in the 1924 law, Germans are Germans. There is no category for a German refugee someone who doesn't, um, for, for one of those subjects as opposed to a citizen, no distinction is made by the U.S. government in the, um, de in, in the delivery of visas and, and how that fits the quota. So that's another really important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so um, when the Simons and all the others book their passage on the St. Louis, they are allowed to take 10 Reichsmarks and what they could carry with them. Um, so, uh, there is, I always do this exercise with students because I think it really brings home to them what the process of leaving in a situation like this might feel like. Um, you know, what do you think you might pack if you could only take one suitcase to leave, you know, the place that you've lived your whole life? So that's one question to think about. And the other is, 
to think about other options. So I will say in 39, um, there was this, the Cuba, wait in Cuba for your visa to come through, hope that you can go to the US. There was also this one other kind of strange but true possibility, which was Shanghai, China. Shanghai was accepting refugees um, and to get there, you could take a very complicated overland route um, by train, um, take small ships, kind of eventually take a ship around to Shanghai. So what, you know, if you had to make that choice, how would you make that choice? And yeah, De Debbie Brett wrote, I think in response to my last question, that Israel wasn't an option in the 30s. And that's really important to, to remember as well. This, at that time, um, Palestine was a British protectorate and they were trying to avoid internecine conflict by not allowing Jews to come and, and potentially come in conflict with the um, Arab population that was there. So um, it's really hard to find a place to go. So does anybody want to quickly share their um, responses to either one of those questions? You know, what might you pack in your suitcase or would you choose something that was maybe certain but really arduous or something that had a little more uncertainty, but seems like it might be a good idea. Yeah, ritual objects. You know, I'm, I'm always, you know, when I think about my time in the Jewish Center Hebrew School, I always, I always think back on the, oh my goodness, the, I don't think it was hay, it was the Zion Museum, am I getting the year right? The Zion Museum, and this was the time when we were all invited to display our family history, and so many people had you know, that was all they had from some of their relatives that had come over from Europe at various times, a pair of candlesticks, you know, um, a kiddush cup, these ritual objects that took on really special meaning when you're, you're leaving your home. Yeah, the Zion Museum. So there you go. That's how I decided to become a curator. Um, so yeah, photographs, that's a big one. And then trying to to take whatever wealth you could with you. So sewing jewelry into your clothing. I mean, it was very risky, but it was also risky to have nothing. So people were constantly trying to figure out how to get their, their, um, their potential to build a new life away from the country that's trying to keep all of their wealth um, behind. Um, so now we're getting to the St. Louis. It took us a while to get there, but now we're on the St. Louis. So we already established that this is not a very large number of people. This is, and, and that they are kind of special in terms of the fact that they were able to save enough money to put it together, to arrange this, to even get on this ship. Um, but now they're on the ship and they're hopeful. So in May of 1939, the St. Louis departs. So we mentioned that there were 930 seven people aboard and 931 of them were refugees. All but six were refugees. Um, Captain Gustav Schrader um, was, um, has been uh, honored with a righteous among the nation status because he really worked to give the passengers a good experience, to treat them like human beings. And so many of them had not been treated like human beings in a very long time. Um, but he is faced with a crisis. May 23rd, um, he receives a cable informing him that the new Cuban law has invalidated the landing permits of a majority of his passengers. And so behind the scenes, he begins to create, um, pulls together a committee of passengers to deal with the crisis. For the Simon family, the time on the St. Louis is, um, is special. You know, these, uh, the, the girls can attend birthday parties. Uh, they, um, there are uh, opportunities for recreation. There's the sea breeze. I mean, on the way to Cuba, there's so much hope that people are feeling about what is going to happen um, for them. 
it's also really interesting, you know, Susan told me the story of how um, their uncle Julius had um, a, uh, was going to meet them in Cuba, had gone there already on another ship, um, because this was a regular thing. We, we remember the St. Louis because it was essentially the last Hamburg America line uh, trip that um, was made with refugees. But this was something that had been going on for years. And the Hamburg America line itself had been around since the 20s. This was a regular, it was a luxury cruise. That's what it was intended to be. So life was good on the ship. Um, but on May 27th, uh, the St. Louis docked in Havana, and there were 28 passengers who had valid US visas. So for them, they already had a place that had guaranteed, they, were, they had a guaranteed place in the United States. They were allowed to disembark, but the rest were not. Um, and so this committee um, of, of passengers interfaces with Lawrence Berenson, who is an attorney for the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. So the JDC is definitely becomes one of the heroes essentially of this story, um, which, uh, attempts to negotiate with President Bru, um, but unfortunately, President Bru does not budge. Um, even, even when the JVC uh, negotiators say, You're not, these people are not gonna be a burden. They're not gonna go on government assistance. You don't have to worry about them. He still doesn't budge. Um, and I often find myself, there's a part of me that thinks about the you know, the, the, the story of Passover and the Pharaoh and this attempt, you're attempting to negotiate and his, his heart is hardened. Um, so the Simon family has this almost encounter with their with Uncle Julius, where he um, takes a small boat out to the ship, like so many others um, who are doing something similar. And the sisters see him and um, they call out to him, but he doesn't see them. So this is, um, you know, a really poignant moment in the story. Um, on June 4th, the St. Louis passes close enough to Miami to see the lights um, from the city. And uh, there, um, there are additional negotiations with the State Department. Earl um, A.M. Warren um, of the State Department cables um, this very cold response, the German refugees, remember the German refugees must await their turn on the waiting list and qualify for and obtain immigration visas before they may be admissible to the United States, period. Um, so the JDC keeps trying. They fail to negotiate asylum in the US or Canada. So the 907 passengers that remain aboard are now headed back toward Europe. So like everyone else on the ship, the Simon family is anxious, awaiting um, knowledge of where they're gonna go. Are they gonna end up back in Germany after all this? Um, and uh, they um, have family members in the United States. So this is true of a lot of people. They actually do have family members in the United States. Um, and so there's a really, frantic, frenzied effort to communicate back and forth with all of these people that could mean a lifeline for the refugees. Here's an example of one of those telegrams. Um, this was uh, cabled uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt, who is, is often depicted and kind of, she's the sympathetic figure. Um, you know, if you look at Franklin Roosevelt tends to be very kind of cold when it comes to immigration issues and even a lot of humanitarian issues, whereas Eleanor is this figure who is, um, you know, perhaps more receptive. So um, that is who um, is the recipient of this telegram, um, trying to appeal to her humanity that um, this, this American citizen, Lottie Frankel's um, parents are on the ship. Can you help? But it does not um, avail them at this time. So, um, this is a really interesting question that kind of came up in my research and in, in looking at the St. Louis and so many photographs. So if you go to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial um, Museum's website um, and search their collection, you'll find many, many beautiful images from the St. Louis. Why were they taking all these pictures um, of themselves, you know, on this boat? 
And um, I, you know, so the question I ask students at this point is if you wanted to be accepted for asylum in a foreign country, how might you present yourself to the media? So I, I, I asked that of you as well. Also, just thank you, Edna, for all of this really wonderfully detailed commentary on the state of affairs in Palestine in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it provides really helpful context. Yeah, Ellen, Ellen Burt, um, affluent, healthy, independent. Yeah, there's a balance. So Mindy writes between, do you want to appear self-sufficient or needy? And you're absolutely right that this is a really challenging thing because if you don't look like you, you're needy, people can look at you and be like, well, what is it? you know, these are a bunch of rich people. What do they need our help for? You know, you're not going to feel that you're, if you're appealing to the heartstrings of a nation, then you want to make sure that you look like someone who needs help. But if you're appealing to the kind of cold calculus of that nation, are you going to become a public burden? You want to look like you are completely self-sufficient, that you will be a contributor, not a uh, sponge, you know, in terms of how you come into that country. So these are things that are really always on the minds of refugees. So negotiating asylum. So this, I, I bring this image to your attention because this is a, a good example. The JDC and its partners worked really hard to publicize the voyage of the St. Louis. And they did so through um, newspaper articles, photographs, and they were doing just this, trying to make these people look like your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. You know, these are people that you would not be afraid of having living near you, and they're not going to steal from you, and they're they're just people like anybody else. Um, so ultimately, the JDC is working very, very hard, and manages to um, get the Netherlands, Belgium, Britain, and France to take refugees. So this image here shows this um, kind of active, a document of that active negotiation, um, outlining how many children, how many women, how many men are among these passengers, and then who's willing to take how many. Holland, 194. Belgium, 250. France, 200. Um, and England, you know, essentially taking the rest. Now, um, where do you think everybody wants to go? Someone can just shout it out. Uh, you can Great un Britain. Great Britain. That's exactly right. This is the country that is um, seems the safest even now. We're, it's 1939. The war hasn't started yet, but everywhere else is really kind of dangerously close to Germany. England is is a safer bet. Um, but the Simons, like everyone, um, like many others, end up. Um, sorry, uh, end up. Uh, granted asylum in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, June 14th, um, the passengers um, essentially radio their thanks back to these countries. And um, June 17th, the ship docks in Antwerp, Belgium, and the passengers disembark and travel um, to their, their new final destinations. Um, I'm going to skip this film right now, but I will share a link to it for anyone who wants to see it. But the JDC uh, produced this film in 1939, which um, really showed the drama of the entire St. Louis episode with really wonderful footage focused on families and children, kind of continuing to try to shape that story. Um, so, that newsreel, once again, was about creating sympathy and not antagonism for these refugees and asylum seekers. So we're now at that point with looking at the fate of the passengers. So remember, there were 937 and 931 were refugees. So 72% um, of the refugees survived the war and 28% perished in the Holocaust. So that's, a really 
I, I want to let that sink in for just a second because we talk about the tragedy of the St. Louis, right? This is the title that we gave to our exhibit, to the presentation. But compared to the numbers um, for Europe's Jewish population, where 66% die in the Holocaust and 33% survive, or excuse me, I'm getting that, um, 40, 38% anyway, my math is not my strong suit. Um, but uh, we are we are looking at um, a better rate of survival for the passengers of the St. Louis as compared with the Jews of Europe. And the JDC asylum uh, negotiation story is kind of a it's it's a um, it's a it's a heroic episode. It's one that can be looked at as um, resistance, you know, in advance to what will become this great tragedy. Um, so we created this pie chart and you'll notice actually just give you a sense, this is in English and Spanish because the exhibit that we produced was bilingual um, across the board. We, we produced it for Kennesaw State University's Year of Cuba. We do a country study every year. And this was a really great opportunity to combine this Holocaust history story with the history of Cuba and really um, also try to get our work out into um, Spanish speaking um, uh, communities or ones where there are plenty of people who might prefer to speak or read Spanish before English. So that's why this is bilingual. But we wanted to show the relative survival rates of these different countries that became the um, sites of asylum. So you'll see 100% survive in Cuba. Those 28 people, they all survived the war. And 100% survive in England. The other countries, is, it, it's much more mixed. And sadly, and this is an entirely other presentation, but the Netherlands have the lowest survival rate. Um, the Jews of the Netherlands, um, which you might remember, that's where Anne Frank and her family went into hiding. Um, they were um, quite misfortunate in terms of the percentage that um, ultimately ends up being um, deported um, and killed by the Nazis. So, I'm not even going to really ask this question, you know, which which would you have hoped to gain asylum in? It was Great Britain. Everybody wanted to go there. Um, but uh, the that wasn't true for a lot of people. So after the voyage, um, September 1st of 1939 is the start of World War II when Nazi Germany invades Poland. Um, by uh, also for those who went to Shanghai. Um, December 8th, Japan takes control of the international settlement in Shanghai, China, um, which had been a haven for Jewish refugees. So this is right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So things are now, they're now under Japanese occupation instead of Chinese um, control. Um, November of 1945, um, so now after the, after the war, this is when um, Dr. Wilhelm Hattel testifies um, up to the death of 6 million Jews at the hands of the Nazis. So we just talked about those numbers, two thirds of the pre-war European population of Jews, um, including a quarter of the German Jews. So another thing to keep in mind, that 1% of the German population, three quarters actually do survive the war. The worst death toll for Jews in Europe is Eastern Europe, the, um, the general government it became known as, but this is Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, all th these places that eventually become those places, the pale of settlement where so many of our um, ancestors, you know, kind of came to the United States from, they're the ones who, who, who served, who had the worst experience. The Simon family, Susan is able to tell me the family story because there are a lot of survivors that kind of end up coming from this family. So, um, but unfortunately, that is not true for those who are on the, for three of the four who are on the St. Louis. So um, they, uh, the, the four of them begin in, um, in uh, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, 
the oldest daughter is able to go first to England and then to the United States. So she manages to, to make the rest of her journey that was intended. She manages to get to the United States. On May 18th of 43, um, Carl, Selma, and Ilsa are taken to Westerbork and they are killed on May 21st um, at Sobibor in Poland. Ruth and Hilda and Edith don't find out about this until, um, until 1945. So this is, there's a, a lot of kind of disconnected pieces of communication at this time as the sisters are trying to find each other and do find each other in the United States. So um, the aftermath, you know, kind of the denouement of this story, um, May 14th, 1948, State of Israel is founded and they take 140,000 Holocaust survivors over the next few years. The United States, under the truth, so President Truman, unlike Roosevelt, was actually, he was personally very um, friendly toward refugees. He was pro-immigrant, pro-refugee, and he um, really wanted a better law than what ended up becoming the Displaced Persons Act of 1948. But under that act, the U.S. admits 400,000 displaced persons. However, only 24% of those are Jewish Holocaust survivors. So we often think of that Displaced Persons Act as like the act that allowed so many Jews to come to the US after, um, after the Holocaust. They were a small percentage, relatively speaking, of those who did. Um, and then we change our immigration laws eventually in this country. Um, in 1965, the Hart-Seller Act eliminates a nation-based quota system. So um, that's no longer in place. And then in 1980, we sign on to, to the UN Refugee Commission's um, refugee protocols. Um, and we're still dealing with that. I and mean, you know, there's so much that we're kind of working on as a nation with regards to our relationship with refugees. For the Simon family, um, Edith, Hilda, and Ruth, um, they, they get married to German Jewish army veterans in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, Ruth's husband, Manfred Heinemann, is also a survivor of uh, the camps um, right after he, he um, was uh, arrested um, right after Kristallnacht, he and his father. Um, September of 48, Susan is born in New York and on October um, 31st, 2019, she recorded her oral history um, with me um, for our Legacy Series Oral History Program. So um, I, I ask these questions, um, you know, does the story of the St. Louis have a moral? Um, if so, what is it? Um, and, uh, you know, how might, and then, you know, here's your action item. How might you advocate on behalf of people seeking refuge or asylum today? And for this question, I think I could probably open it up to those who want to unmute themselves and, and speak. I've contacted our um senators in Washington. And I got one response so far from John Ossoff about the immigrants in uh, Ukraine. And uh, he, he, he's obviously aware of it and they're working on solutions. But um, I feel it's very important that we speak up as human beings, not only as Jews, to help other populations, even though they were quite um, anti-Semitic, apparently, during the war, um, we have an obligation. Different generation. Yes, that's what I feel too, the different yeah. generation. So that's, that's one of the ways you can share your uh, feelings. Well, I know that the Jewish Center in Princeton and a number of synagogues, including mine in Atlanta, sponsor refugee families. Um, you know, so that's sort of a small, a small thing that we can do. You know, and it's amazing how much work it takes. Like when you're actually on the ground looking at, like you know, a whole community to sponsor one family is a real, and and there's a lot to that. Um, you know, Susan um, is just an 
in the process of finishing up a memoir about her family that goes into more detail about how the sisters were, were sponsored and, and how it had to be people who were citizens and who were established who could actually sponsor them and get them um, established in, in, in the United States. So knowing the big sort of pieces, you know, the advocacy, but also that on the ground, you know, do you make clothing for people? Um, do you teach English? Do you, you know, there's so many things that people can do. Um, I was watching the Ben Franklin uh, documentary on PBS and at the very end, Ken Burns, who had just done the Ben Franklin documentary comes on and says, I am working on a project that I'm very proud of. And this September on PBS, my documentary about how America responded to the Holocaust will be airing. So wow. I wanna tell you all to keep your eyes open because if people don't learn how poorly we respond as a country to uh, immigrants, I don't American Jews, non-Jews, Spanish. We don't a Chinese, the Japanese who were here as citizens. Uh, we don't do a good job. Yeah, Roosevelt did not allow the uh, train tracks all over Europe that went went to uh, Auschwitz to be bombed, so that people couldn't be transported by train. So that's one of the things that he didn't do that he should have. Yeah. There's a wonderful exhibit just to keep your, um, to, to turn your attention to so you know about it, um, that the US Holocaust Memorial Museum recently had on display and has a, a, there's a digital version of it as well called Americans and the Holocaust. I highly recommend it. It kind of goes through all of these different factors um, in some really interesting ways. I wanna to respond to Linda's um, question about whether we are more motivated to take action on behalf of refugees from Europe than from other parts of the world. And I think it's a really good question. And it's one that I know a lot of organizations um, in my local area um, that I have a relationship with. One of them is a wonderful organization called Refugee Women's Network. After the outpouring of response in a lot of ways for those new refugees from the Ukraine, they kind of published a statement saying, this is wonderful and this should be the kind of outpouring of response that happens whenever there's a refugee crisis um, anywhere in the world. So I think that's really good to keep in mind. Um, Louise uh, Sandberg, I see your hand up. I think most of you know I work with refugees and it is a little hurtful to see that first we had the Syrians and there was a great need and now we have the Afghans, there's a huge need. And now all of a sudden everybody wants to help the Ukrainians, but where were they when we were asking for help for the Afghans and the Syrians? And yes, we're Jews, we should help everyone, but there are big questions here. Yeah. And the Haitians as well. Yeah. So someone in the chat asked, how do you teach people about the past who seem to be influenced by the biased news programs that they watch? So the, the one thing I say to that, and I mean, I think about this all the time. I mean, if you if you could sit at my in, at my dinner table and listen to me ranting with my husband, you know, um, I'm, I'm really worried about this kind of thing. But the thing that seems to connect people to to the past, to these big stories are those individual family stories that need history face-to-face -face aspect. If you can see yourself in the, um, in, in the stories that we tell in history and you can see how, you know, you're, who you are, whether you're a father, a mother, a, a sister, a, a doctor, a taxi driver, you know, some, some aspect of your identity and you see that in others, that is, that is what can break through, I think, a little bit of that um, overlay, that sort of meta narrative that we, that we are told through our political, um, the oriented media sources. And I'm not saying it works all the time, but I think for, that there are moments when people kind of forget what they're supposed to think about something and instead just engage with it on that storytelling um, level. Um, Dr. Mike yeah. Rosenthal. 
Yeah, it's Mike. They kept Dr. Rip. I don't know why. My parents liked it. But okay, uh, two things. Number one, I see serious parallels between everything we talked about today and what's happening now. Um, the other thing is that people are afraid of what our immigrants going to do. Uh, the Jewish community, when it, when the Jewish people came to America, uh, formed their own communities. Uh, they had their own organizations. They didn't try to mix in with everybody else. So I don't think immigrants are going to be a problem. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, I think that there is a trajectory that um, immigration and that the, the formation of immigrant communities. I mean, that's that's a subject. Um, that's what we are. That's who we are. That you know, there's yeah a lot of um, understanding about what it takes to make connections. You know, why you might come to one place or another. Um, you know, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, for example, you know, worked really hard to place incoming refugees in communities that had other families who might be available to welcome them. So the networking effect is always in place. And that kind of counter that fear narrative about, oh, they won't, they won't assimilate, they won't mix in. People are always making connections with those that they share interests, values, language, culture. And then they're also, you know, whether it's the next generation or it's certain individuals, they're also connecting with the broader community. And so there is no one narrative, you know, about how immigrants, you know, become or don't become assimilated or part of our society. So I think that that's one of the really important things to think about. Uh, Linda, you have your hand up, Linda Oppenheim. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for this. This is really, really wonderful. And uh, looking forward to, to working with you in the fall when we bring one of your other uh, exhibits on black and Jewish in the um, uh, to the, the Jewish Center. Early on in your presentation about the Avion Conference, and you mentioned that only the Dominican Republic was opening its doors completely to, to Jews. And I've heard, and it's kind of a personal interest because our youngest son was born in the Dominican Republic, but I had heard that Trujillo's motivation was to whiten the population of the Dominican Republic. Is there really any documentation? Is there any solid evidence about that? That is a really interesting question. And I'm going to add it to my list of, of research topics because I don't know the answer to that right now. So, um, you know, it is one of those really interesting things about when you think about these international conferences, the diplomacy, you know, so the US convened that conference, but we only sent, we sent a sort of third level diplomat to it. We didn't even send anybody who was high up in the State Department. So the kind of signaling that people will do, you know, in terms of how big a priority is this? Why are we doing this? Is it just that we're convening a conference and now we can say, hey, we convene a conference? You know, um, is something that I'm I'm really interested in. I think we could do a whole exhibit about that at the conference. So I would love to research that more. I don't want to. I know we're after one o'clock, and I I want to make sure that people know that they don't have to stay, but I'm willing to stay and answer more questions. Um, you know, and as Linda mentioned, we the Jewish Center will be hosting one of our traveling exhibits um, called Black and Jewish. Um, Connection Courage Community um, coming up this fall. Um, so I am really looking forward to, um, to, to you being a host for that exhibit and to supporting that however I can. I just wanted to share these pictures with you as well. So just to emphasize that intergenerational kind of connections um, across time, uh, this is that tragedy of the St. Louis exhibit when we had it on display at the Marietta Museum of History um, just two months ago. Um, this is, is Susan, this is her wonderful mother, Ruth Simon Heinemann, um, me before I cut my hair. And then uh, this is uh, Susan's husband, Steve, and her incredibly adorable grandson, Finn. So you can see that he's now making those intergenerational connections um, right there. But this also gives you a sense of what, you know, the pop-up panels for one of our traveling exhibits look like in a space. 
so in case you were sort of wondering, hey, what's this black and Jewish exhibit going to look like when it comes to the Jewish Center? Um, they're very movable and um, they can be in that space. Um, so oh, I, 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 if I may add my two cents. First of all, yeah. Adina, thank you. This was amazing. And I have to tell you, I'm going to steal some of your stuff from my Holocaust class when we talk about the St. Louis for sure. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Sue Berman. Um, Sue and I have been friends since 1979 when George and I first moved to Georgia. And if I remember correctly, Sue, you invited us to either your, for your Seder or to one of your friend Seders because we had just moved there. Right. So yeah, we that's had how we home. met. And uh, Sue and we I go back a together. long way. Yep. And Sue's always been an amazing advocate for people. I remember how active you were in the Soviet Refusenik movement also. Mm -hmm. So this is amazing. And I'm and I have to credit Sue, who sent me pictures of uh, she and, and Adina and her mom a while back because they were participating in the exhibit and boing, the light went off. And I said, I have to ask Adina to be a great mind salon presenter. So Sue, you are a part of this. Well, thank so, you. And thank you, Adina. You did a wonderful, wonderful job. And amazing. Ellen, uh, I commend you for being a leader in the Jewish community, no matter where you are. <laughs> you always make I try. <laughs> you make an impact, so, a positive one. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, And I'm, I'm so happy for all of you who joined. I know this was an amazing presentation. And Adina, it's, it's kind of you to want, you know, to stay on if anybody has any further questions. I'm happy to keep the, the meeting open. Yeah, happy to. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, when I first met Susan, she handed me her card and her card said people collector. And I think that that's a, a real truth in terms of the relationships that she has made and maintained um, across the different places that she has lived and um, traveled. So I'm just honored to know you and also you, of course, Ellen and everybody here. So um, let me just see, I think, yeah, this is all I, I, I had. I just wanted to share this slide as well. These are resources for further exploration. Um, so one of them, and I'm, I'm gonna take the second, let me see if it'll pop up without messing things up too much yet. So this is our Georgia Journeys um, digital exhibit that, that goes through the full story um, that Susan shared um, about her family. You can see how it spans both sides of the Atlantic and there are a lot of really interesting locations here. Um, so I invite you to, to take some time to spend with this. Um, and then also um, the, um, we created a Twitter diary um, back in 2020 um, that went moment by moment um, from April um, of 2020 all the way through uh, June, um, kind of going through the whole St. Louis. So this is another, if you're teaching about it, um, this is a resource that you might find helpful um, in kind of connecting your students with the story. Um, and uh, that's, this is just the, the exhibit website. And here's my email address if anybody has any questions that they want to reach out to me to talk about. So um, yeah, thank you everybody. And yeah, I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer um, if anybody wants to talk some more. I see um, Mike's hand is up. Yes, so uh, we haven't explored today and I think it's interesting. Um, one of the things that comes about from all this, for example, is that many of the Russian uh, people that, of the intelligentsia, the physicians and lawyers, the professors are trying to get out of Russia. So if they leave, what's, the, what's it gonna leave them with? And then what's gonna happen there? Yeah, that's a really good point too. And there, there's some, well, you're gonna see when, we, when you get the black and Jewish exhibit, we have a little bit in there about the really interesting phenomenon of how um, some of the historically black colleges and universities um, took Jewish refugee professors um, on in terms of their, um, their faculty. Um, and there, there are those kinds of direct connections that people can make or not, you know, in terms of helping those who are trying to get out of a regime as it's changing. So even before you get to the point of 
sort of no return in terms of how the legal system has changed. Yeah, the, the restrictions on refugees during the period of what we talked about in your uh, wonderfully presented and uh, researched uh, uh, work today was that uh, even Albert Einstein couldn't get in and because he had no job. So thankfully, the place called Princeton University said, we will found the Institute for Advanced Study and he can come and teach her. So now he has a job, so let him in. So yeah, these structures that we create, you know, legalistically, which might, you know, to, to someone's mind, they might make sense politically, they might make sense on paper, but the way that they affect real people um, is something that I think we all really need to keep in mind all the time. Um, yeah, anybody else have anything you want to ask or share? You can always email me. Um, well, I'm not seeing anything pop up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say I want to thank you again. I don't know if we have any more comments or questions, but it's been fabulous. And I, I'm not surprised. Having been your teacher, I knew what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I lived up to your expectations. You did. You did. To for be sure. <laughs> back virtually. I just want to wish, wish you and your family a happy Pesach, as well as everybody on screen. Have happy Pesach, everybody. Um, have a wonderful well. holiday. Be I was well. just thinking that maybe if you want to take the slide, the screen sharing off, then people could see each other and, you know, for the last. And time. I'm going to stop recording also. Sure.